welcome to Pulp Today. Having a little bit of red wine. I didn't have any grog or, uh, well, I did just get a good rum on hand. Uh, for today's episode, uh, we're going down a, a path of pulp that I haven't actually hit yet. And I'm surprised because a lot of my favorite books are in that genre, and that is the swashbuckling kind of pulp. Well, I don't, I mean, we haven't even done Zorro yet. We'll get to Zorro. Um, today I want to talk about, um, Captain Horatio Hornblower, a 12 no novel series, much like Star Wars and Galactic Patrol, uh, or I should say, uh, the Lensman series, the, uh, the, the project was begun in the middle, the first book published in 37 by C.S. Forrester, the writer, Hornblower's, Hornblower's already a captain, or at least of a high rank, I haven't read it in a while. And uh, there are 12 novels, and somewhere about a decade into writing them, he went, you know what, I think I'm going to go back and start at the beginning of Horn Hornblower's career, and we get Mr. Midshipman Hornblower. Uh, I also have it in this very nice hardcover volume, which I think I've had since I was a little boy. I'm not sure. Interesting thing about this series and about Hornblower, it's funny what can lead you into something I was familiar with Forrester as a as a you know I was familiar with the movie version of Hornblower I was familiar with the African Queen which he wrote which uh, John Huston filmed with Bogart and Catherine Hepburn but it was I think Gene Roddenberry talking about the antecedents to Star Trek and saying that there was a lot of Horatio Hornblower in Captain Kirk who was one of my favorite characters I went I should read some horn no hornblower novels someday, and so uh, it's it's not a bad thing to start Star Wars in the order they were written and not the order they chronologically take place. Works for the Lensman series too. It's perfectly fine to start Hornblower at the beginning uh, with Mister Midshipman Hornblower. I picked a, a section that requires a little bit of setup. This first book chronologically is almost a collection of short stories, vignettes from the life of young Hornblower when he was a lowly midshipman. And there's a there's a chapter called The Man Who Felt Queer. It is Hornblower's first mini command. A French corvette is hiding in the, I should say, these stories take place around the turn of the 18th century and uh, 1812, 1814, the Napoleonic period. Um, the French are at war with England, and uh, Hornblower is a midshipman on the Indefatigable, and they have chased a French corvette, and it is hiding in a, in a harbor where it is protected by the guns of two French forts. The captain takes the Indefatigable out of harm's way, away from the guns, and then has decided to send four boats full of sold sailors to take the ship man-to-man -man, rather than uh, naval engagement. Hornblower is put in charge of the fourth ship, the Jolly Boat, which is a very small boat, only seven men in it, and his job is to do this terrifying thing which is climb up to the top sheets, the sails, and lower them so that the men can capture the ship and sail it out into the bay, out of the bay, at which point it can be captured by the indefatigable. Hornblower is terrified of heights. He hates that he has to do this. He develops a sick stomach in the briefing and decides not to object because there really isn't any way for a British sailor to say, I'm scared, I don't want to do that. One of his men, named Hale, I believe, uh, confesses, Hales, confesses to feeling a little sickly, which they take for cowardice. Uh, he then proceeds to have a seizure on the boat with Hornblower in command as they are sailing in hopefully silence, not sailing, rowing in silence to surprise the French Corvette. And Hornblower is faced with a fairly horrifying command decision for the first time. Silently, the boats glided up the estuary. 
Soames in the cutter was setting a slow pace, with only an occasional stroke at the oars to maintain steerage way. Presumably, he knew very well what he was doing. The channel he had selected was an obscure one between mud banks, impracticable for anything except small boats, and he had a 20-foot pole with which to, do, to take the soundings, quicker and much more silent than using the lead. Minutes were passing fast, and yet the night was still utterly dark, with no hint of approaching dawn. Strain his eyes as he would, Hornblower could not be sure that he could see the flat shores on either side of him. It would call for sharp eyes on the land to detect the little boats being carried up by the tide. Hales at his feet stirred and then stirred again. His hand, feeling round in the darkness, found Hornblower's ankle and apparently examined it with curiosity. He uttered something, the words dragging out into a moan. Shut up whispered Hornblower, trying, for, like the saint of old, to make a tongue of his whole body that he might express the urgency of the occasion without making a sound audible at any distance. Hale set his or elbow on Hornblower's knee and levered himself up into a sitting position, and then levered himself up further until he was standing, swaying with bent knees and supporting himself against Hornblower. "'Sit down, damn you!' whispered Hornblower, shaking with fury and anxiety. "'Where's Mary?' asked Hales in a conversational tone. Shut up! Mary, said Hales, lurching against him. Mary! Each successive word was louder. Hornblower felt instinctively that Hales would soon be speaking in a loud voice, that he might even soon be shouting. Old recollect recollections of conversations with his doctor father stirred at the back of his mind. He remembered that persons emerging from epileptic fits were not responsible for their actions, and might be and often were, dangerous. Mary, said Hales again. Victory and the lives of a hundred men depended on silencing Hales and silencing him instantly. Hornblower thought of the pistol in his belt and of using the butt, but there was another weapon more conveniently to his hand. He unshipped the tiller, a three-foot bar of solid oak, and he swung it with all the venom of, and fury of despair. The tiller crashed down on Hale's head, and Hale's, an unuttered word cut short in his throat, fell silent in the bottom of the boat. There was no sound from the boat's crew, save for something like a sigh from Jackson. Whether approving or disapproving, disapproving Hornblower neither knew nor cared. He had done his duty, and he was certain of it. He had stuck down, struck down a helpless idiot, and most probably he had killed him. But the surprise upon which the success of the expedition depended had not been imperiled. He reshipped the tiller and resumed the silent task of keeping in the wake of the gigs. Far away ahead in the darkness, it was impossible to estimate the distance, there was a nucleus of greater darkness, close on the surface of the black water. It might be the corvette. A dozen more silent strokes and Hornblower was sure of it. Soames had done a magnificent job of pilotage, leading the boats straight to their objective. The cutter and launch were diverging now from the two gigs. The four boats were separating in readiness to launch their simultaneous converging attack. Easy, whispered Hornblower, and the jolly boat's crew ceased to pull. Hornblower had his orders. He had to wait until the attack had gained a foothold on the deck. His hand clenched convulsively on the tiller. The excitement of dealing with Hales had driven the thought of having to ascend the strange rigging in the darkness clear out of his head and now it recurred with redoubled ur urgency. Hornblower was afraid. Although he could see the corvette, the boats had vanished from his sight, had passed out of his field of vision. The corvette rode to her anchor, her spars just visible against the night sky. That was where he had to climb? She seemed to tower up hugely. Close by the corvette he saw a splash in the dark water. The boats were closing in fast, and someone's stroke had been a little careless. At the same moment came a shout from the corvette's deck, and when the shout was repeated it echoed a hundred folds from the boats rushing alongside. The yelling was lusty and prolonged, of set purpose. A sleeping enemy would be bewildered by the din, and the progress of the shouting would tell each boat's crew of the extent of the success of the others. The British seamen were yelling like madmen. A flash and a bang from the corvette's deck told of the firing of the first shot. Soon pistols were popping and muskets banging from several points of the deck. "'Give way,' said Hornblower. He uttered the order as if it had been torn from him by the rack. The jolly boat moved forward. 
while Hornblower fought down his feelings and tried to make out what was going on on board. He could see no reason for choosing either side of the corvette in preference to the other, and the larboard side was the nearer, so he steered the boat to the larboard main chains. So interested was he in what he was doing that he only remembered in the nick of time to give the order in oars. He put the tiller over and the boat swirled round and the bowman hooked on. From the deck just above came a noise exactly like a tinker hammering on a cooking pot. Hornblower noted the curious noise as he stood up in the stern sheets. He felt the cutlass at his side and the pistol in his belt, and then he sprang for the chains. With a mad leap, he reached them and hauled himself up. The shrouds came into his hands, his feet found the ratlines beneath them, and he began to climb. As his head cleared the bulwark and he could see the deck, the flash of a pistol shot illuminated the scene momentarily, fixing the struggle on deck in a static moment, like a picture. Before and below him, a British seaman was fighting a furious cutlass duel with a French officer, and he realized with vague astonishment that the kettle-mending noise he had heard was the sound of cutlass against cutlass, that clash of steel against steel that poets write about. So much for romance. I'll stop it on that nice meta moment where C.S. Forrester tells you that maybe swords, cutlasses clanging against each other doesn't have a very romantic or sexy or appealing sound of ringing steel like you read in the other books. Um, as you as you maybe get from that whole uh, section, Hornblower is our hero, but he is presented in a very realistic psychological light. He He is afraid of things. He has blind spots. He has incompetences uh, that he works to overcome. Uh, and he's a, he's a great character to, to, to follow in all of these, uh, in all of these many uh, dozen novels. Uh, I recommend the series very highly. The film with Gregory Peck is an odd duck. It's based on three of the novels, including the first one that uh, Forrester wrote, The Happy Return. Uh, I mean, obviously, Peck is not English, and if I remember correctly, he does not attempt an accent, which, you know, good for him. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange version of the character. Far more uh, true to Forrester is the, uh, there was an a &E miniseries a bunch of years ago with Ewan Griffin, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, the, the, un the, the unfortunate Mr. Fantastic of the two Fantastic Four movies. Uh, fine actor though, and a great leading man. It's a it's a pity that didn't work out for him. But uh, but those are very good and very faithful to the novels. But the novels themselves are are very entertaining. Um, if you want to spend some time in that period, uh, they're they're terrific escapism. His name was Charles. I'm gonna, his name was not C. S. Forrester, and I don't quite know. Cecil Lewis Troughton Smith. He somehow got C.S. Forrester out of that. Oh, and I wanted to, when speaking of, uh, it's interesting how cultural currency waxes and wanes. There was a recent Tom, Cru Tom, Tom Hanks film called uh, Greyhound, also based on a C.S. Forrester novel, and it struck me as interesting that none of that, name again, this is an old man's complaint, but at no point in any trailer did it say from the author of The Adventures of Horatio Hornblower and The African Queen, which, you know, classic movie. Might have made three more people, me one of them, see the Tom Hanks film. I will probably catch up with it on Apple Plus one of these days. That's all for this swashbuckling adventure. Look and listen, listen, listen for the sound of ringing steel on steel. It sounds a lot like copper pots being banged with a hammer. Have a lovely week. See you next time.